Since we have a new pope, I thought it might be appropriate to tell a pope story. That is, if it's ever appropriate to tell a pope story. <laughs> pope Benedict had to make a, uh, a, a kind of a quiet uh, trip to New York for a meeting. And he landed at Kennedy Airport out on the tarmac. He had a limo that came out and picked him up at, at his plane. And as he was getting ready to get in the limo, he said to the driver, he said, you know, I've always had a secret interest in wanting to drive one of these stretch limousines. Why don't you let me drive and you getting back? <laughs> well, it was about 11 o'clock at night. There wasn't much traffic along the FDR freeway, along the East River, and the Pope got to going a little bit too fast. And he was stopped by one of New York's finest. Uh, the uh, policeman came up. He looked in the car to see who was there went back to his uh, squad car and radioed headquarters. He said, I've got a problem here. I've, uh, I've stopped somebody who is really important. And the guy at headquarters said, well, who is it, uh, Mayor Bloomberg? Oh, no, he said, more important than that. <laughs> well, is it Governor Cuomo? Oh, no, more important than that. He said, well, who is it? He said, you, don't, you know, I don't know, but the Pope is his driver. <laughs> So uh, very foolishly, I'm going to try to talk about a whole lot of subjects in a relatively short period of time. Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Syria, North Korea, China, and then the subject that's actually more interesting to me or I'm more interested in is technology and, uh, and globalization. So we're going to start with uh, the countries that I'm going to talk about in the Middle East. You'll notice these are uh, from Afghanistan over to Syria. Did I mention Syria? We're going to talk about Syria. We're going to talk about North Korea, too. But anyway, these all run uh, right across east to west. Uh, they are, uh, for the history buffs, that's the old Seleucid Empire, the empire that uh, developed after Alexander died, it's about around 300 BC. And his empire was divided into thirds, and this was one of the thirds. It ran from Syria over to Afghanistan. Uh, it's really hard to work that into any kind of a conversation, but I just did. Uh, okay. We're going to start with Afghanistan. And what I, well, let's start with a cartoon, first of all. What uh, this official is saying is uh, to win, we need to give him, uh, we need to move him from the 12th century here to the 21st century, way over there, while he tries to kill you. <laughs> And the uh, soldier says, time travel, interesting plan, okay. So I, what I want to do with Afghanistan is give some historical perspective on it to get some kind of notion as to what may happen after, uh, after we're out of there. Uh, Afghanistan has been in a civil war for about 40 years. Uh, broadly speaking, there's two different sides, the traditionalists and the fundamentalists. The traditionalists are more urban. They are uh, uh, more, more secular, more liberal. The fundamentalists are more rural. They are more religious. Uh, about a fourth of the population are urban. About three-fourths of the population are, are, are fundamentalists. Now, within that, of course, you have the Pashtuns, the uh, uh, Tajiks, the Haziris. There's a lot of different ethnic groups. And when, within the ethnic, ethnic groups, there are, of course, a lot of tribes. But uh, so I'm going to talk about it in terms in terms of just sort of the two uh, major groups. The, there's the traditionalists, the urban people, and, and the rural people. In 1973, Dodd Khan assumed power. Uh, he eased out uh, the king, who had been there for about 40 years. The king went into exile in, uh, in, in Great Britain. Uh, five years later, Nur uh, Mohammed Tariki seized power. He was the first communist to take over. Uh, he executed Dodd Khan, and that was what was beginning, the beginning of what the Afghans call the Tsar Rev Revolution. It's the April Revolution. It was, uh, this all took place in April. Uh, Turkey was a uh, pretty vicious person. He uh, imprisoned or executed uh, a lot of people, including some of his fellow communists. Um, one of them, well, okay, he wasn't doing very well. Yeah, there was a lot of opposition to him. So he tried to get the Soviets to come in. Uh, the statement by Kosygin in response, I think, is remarkable. Kosygin said, 
to his request, we believe it would be a fatal mistake to commit ground troops. If our troops went in, the situation in your country would not improve. On the contrary, it would get worse. Uh, prophetic statement. Okay, in September of 78, uh, Taraki was assassinated. He tried to, he tried to kill a fellow communist, uh, Haf Hafizullah Amin, uh, the prime minister. He tried three times. The third time, he, it backfired. So Amin became the head of, uh, of state. Uh, he was also a pretty vicious guy. Uh, he, he did do some liberalization. He, he believed in educating uh, females, uh, girls. Uh, uh, he stopped the sale of uh, uh, daughters for marriage. Uh, he did some of those things, but uh, he, was, uh, he, he also was a pretty vicious person. The jihadists were strongly opposed to him. He was a godless dictator. Uh, the jihadists rounded up 100 Soviet citizens and then executed them. Well, that's what led to the Soviet uh, invasion of uh, Afghanistan. So in 79, the Soviets invade. <clears throat> they make their headquarters at Bagram Air Base. You, you're familiar with that term because that's where the Americans make their headquarters now. A man is executed. They put in another communist, uh, Babrak Carmel, uh, became the ruler. In 1984, the U.S. were supporting the Mujahideen. Yeah, I'm sure you all remember that. We supported the Hakini Network. The Hakini Network today is probably the worst enemy that the Americans have in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan, Pakistan, they spend a lot of time across the board in Afghanistan. They were on our payroll uh, back in, in these days. Of course, Al-Qaeda was as well. Uh, the, the Mujahideen then evolved into uh, the Taliban. Uh, they are either the same people, as, as in the case of the Akinis, or in some cases, they're the children of uh, the leaders. So what's really happened is, it was, is we changed sides in, in Afghanistan. We supported the, the Mujahideen, and then we are now uh, opposing the Taliban. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so in 1986, Gorbachev replaced Karman uh, with uh, Mohammad Najibullah. Uh, the, and the same year, he told the Politburo that the Soviets were going to have to uh, withdraw from uh, uh, Afghanistan. They started the withdrawal the next year. Uh, this was a time of, the, of Charlie Wilson's war. Uh, I don't know, did a lot of you seen the movie, Charlie Wilson's War? It's a, it's a, a great movie. I, I loved it. Uh, and and as, as you will remember from the war, we provided Stinger missiles uh, to the Mujahideen. They were used to shoot down Soviet helicopters. Uh, they weren't quite as accurate as they were portrayed to be in the, um, in the war in Charlie Wilson's war, but they were fairly accurate. The, the, the unfortunate thing about those missiles were a lot of them were left over, and they are now being used to, and have been used to shoot down American helicopters. Uh, when you hear that an American helicopter was taken down by ground fire, uh, at least I was told this by a, a, a veteran, it's oftentimes uh, one of those Stinger missiles that we provided to the Mujahideen. Okay, the Soviets complete their uh, withdrawal in 89. Uh, Naj Najibullah's government falls uh, in 1992, and uh, the Civil War continues. In, four years later, in 1996, the Taliban leader Mullah Mohammed Omar captures uh, Kabul and takes over the government there, uh, and Al Qaeda moves into uh, Afghanistan. Now, this is four years after Najibullah has been out of office, but he was considered a uh, puppet of the Soviets. And so there was a lot of resentment towards him. Uh, you have a picture of what happened to him. Uh, he, he's actually the guy on the uh, right in this picture. His brother is the one in the center of the picture. Uh, both of them were hung because he was a puppet of the Soviets. Uh, now, the reason that this is important, the reason I put this picture in here, is because Hamid Karzai has been called a puppet of the Americans. Hamid Karzai certainly has seen this picture and probably has a copy of it. Uh, and so he's becoming, if, if you follow the, you know, the, the news on Afghanistan, he's becoming a lot more anti-American. Uh, it's because, I, I would argue that it's because of his concern uh, you know, for his future. So 9-11, 2001, Al-Qaeda attacks the U.S., the British, and, uh, and, the, and the Americans um, invade Afghanistan and oust uh, Omar. 
Uh, in 2003, 80% of al-Qaeda have been killed or captured. Uh, they have uh, 50 to 100 remaining. That, is, uh, that includes women and children. Uh, at that point in time, the U.S. redeployed assets to Iraq. Uh, we were more interested in getting Saddam Hussein than we were finishing off al-Qaeda. Uh, the interesting thing about this is Larry Lawrence Wright, who wrote the book uh, Looming Towers. I don't know if any of you read it. It's really a great book. It just reads like a novel. It is uh, about al-Qaeda, uh, and he's probably one of the, he's probably the top expert on al-Qaeda. Uh, at any rate, I had a chance to talk to him one-on-one uh, -on -one for about an hour, and he said there would have been no global war on terror if we had finished getting rid of the 50 to 100 uh, members of al-Qaeda uh, before we invaded Iraq. I, I thought that was a pretty interesting observation of his. Um, so this is kind of the history. Uh, I said I want to talk about the history. Uh, Khan took over Iraq, the king is exiled. Uh, Taraki uh, took over, Khan was executed. Amin took over, Taraki was executed. Carmen took over, Amin was executed. Now Jabullah took over, Carmen was exiled to Moscow, which is close to being executed. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then Omar uh, Mar took over, and a few years later they hung now Jabullah. So now uh, Karzai is uh, leading, and um, Omar is, is executed. Um, exiled. exiled, I'm sorry, exiled. He's exiled. He's in, uh, at, presumably, in Pakistan. So in 2013, here's sort of where we are. Uh, the, the U.S. spends about $100, $100 billion a year on, on security in Afghanistan. Uh, we're getting ready to leave. The Afghan gross national product is $20 billion a year. Uh, that raises, a, I'm a finance guy, basically. That's just, uh, and, and these figures are pretty easy to do here. <laughs> this arithmetic is not hard. Uh, it, it makes me wonder how the Afghans are going to continue uh, any kind of a security program. So uh, my expectation, and this is opinion, is that the Civil War is just going to continue going on. Uh, an Indian journalist whose name I d can't get and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't pronounce it if I did get it or spell it, had a really interesting observation on the American uh, involvement in, in some of these countries. He said, when a foreign power invades a country and removes an unpopular dictator, they are loved if they lead, leave, leave within five months. If they stay for five years, they are not respected, not feared, they are hated. Uh, I, I think uh, it's a pretty good observation. So now we're going to talk about Iraq. And as Joe said, this, is, this week is the 10th anniversary uh, of the uh, invasion of Iraq. So The Economist had an appropriate uh, cartoon this week. If you, I know some, many of you subscribe to The Economist. It's a celebration of the um, Iraq invasion. There's Cheney and Rumsfeld and Powell. And uh, Bush has a cake for them. The name on the cake is War Rationale. And he says, it's half-baked. <laughs> that didn't get a very big laugh. Right? <laughs> uh, so we are now going to talk about, or try to look at the question of who won the war in Iraq. Uh, the Financial Times had an article last, last week. The headline for their article was Iraq, 10 years on. The U.S. won the war, Iran won the peace, and Turkey won the contracts. Um, <laughs> Kofi Annan was on uh, the Charlie Rose show. I, yeah, I'm probably going to quote Charlie Rose show quite a bit. It's my favorite show on television. Anyway, uh, he was on the Charlie Rose show, and Charlie Rose asked that question, who, who do you think won the war in Iraq? Uh, his answer was Iran. Uh, he also said that uh, most Middle East experts would give you the same answer. So given that, I thought, well, I'm going to try to look and see what has happened to each of the three sort of major participants, Iran, Iraq, and the United States, uh, how, how did this war impact them? First of all, Iran. Well, what we did was we removed Iran's worst enemy. Uh, we reduced the co their cost of border security. They had an enormous number of troops protecting their border from Iraq. Uh, we converted Iraq from uh, their worst enemy to one of their closest allies. And today, most of the Iraqi leaders, the people who lead Iraq, most of them were exiles in Iran. Uh, uh, during the uh, Saddam Hussein years. So they not only have a close religious link, they're all Shia, 
uh, they're not all Shia, but they are they're dominantly Shia. They not only have a close uh, religious link, but uh, a lot of them have a close personal link uh, to the Iranians. So then take a look at Iraq. Okay, so how were they impacted? Uh, we removed Saddam Hussein. Uh, they have uh, more freedom. Uh, they have uh, a lot more access to the internet. Uh, a lot of them were very restricted in their ability to go to the shrines. That access is all opened up. The results for the people is somewhat mixed. It's been a great boon to the Kurd. Kurdistan is really doing extremely well economically. Uh, the Shiites a little more mixed. You know, they're they're in power. It's been good for the males. Uh, the females have a lot more restriction. They're restricted in the job they can have. They have to wear the bob. It's uh, they're a little more restricted. And of course, the Sunnis were the big losers. Uh, the government uh, is very corrupt and very dysfunctional. We think of our government as being dysfunctional. It's, it's no comparison to how dysfunctional the uh, Iraqi government is. So uh, in the, in, during the war, there were 133,000 combatants killed. There were 125,000 uh, civilians killed. 7.8 million were displaced. And a poll in December of, of Iraqis, 66% of them uh, opposed the, uh, the US war. So now I want to take a look at how this all impacted the US. Uh, unfortunately, Al Qaeda was re resurrected. It was almost a dead organization. And when we invaded Iraq, uh, they were able to recruit a lot more people. They were able to uh, get a lot more money. Uh, and they were able to carry out terrorist attacks you know, around the world, uh, London, uh, uh, Madrid, Bali. So they were resurrected. Uh, Iran restarted a, a dormant nuclear program, as did North Korea. Uh, Iraq now supports Hezbollah, Hamas, Assad, and Iran. Uh, none of these were supported uh, before. The uh, Department of Defense says that the direct costs for the war were $758 billion. Um, I just read recently the ongoing health care costs are expected to be around a trillion dollars. There are 880,000 uh, veterans who have applied for medical benefits. Most of those have applied for full disability, uh, which is why the cost uh, for the next, this is for the next 10 years. Uh, it'll go on for decades after that, but uh, that's the estimate for the next 10 years. Brown University recently did a study, and they estimate the total cost for Iran and Afghanistan, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, to the United States will be about $4.4 trillion. Uh, a survey last week, 58% uh, of the Americans uh, said it wasn't worth it. Uh, again, I'm a finance guy. The return on investment here isn't, uh, isn't, what, isn't the kind of return on investment I'd look for. Okay, now we're going to talk really quickly about Iran, because I've got to keep moving through this. Uh, here's the cartoon. I ran, and I lost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Gina John and uh, the loser. Okay. The only thing I'm going to say about this is yeah, the big issue, of course, is their nuclear program. Uh, so I started thinking back to the last time we really had a serious issue with a nuclear program. It was, it was Cuba. There were nuclear weapons uh, right off our shore. And uh, what was done to get rid of them? What Kennedy did, which, which I think is a, a remarkable, he figured out a way to get Khrushchev to remove the weapons and save face. And what he did was he agreed that uh, we would not invade Cuba. And he agreed that within the next five years, we will take the nuclear missiles out of Turkey that are on the border of, uh, of the Soviet Union. And that allowed Khrushchev to go back to the Politburo and say, yeah, I got what I wanted. We can take the missiles out now. And they did. Uh, I haven't seen any indication that we're tried that kind of an approach at all with the uh, um, with Iran. It, it, just, it seems to be just putting more and more pressure on. Yeah, maybe that'll work. I don't know. But uh, we know this worked uh, very, very well. OK, Syria is going to be pretty quick, too. Um, the question was, <laughs> this is get in or stay out, or get in a little bit, or, you know. Here are the considerations. Um, the rebel groups are not unified, as you all know that. I, you're you're going to know most of this stuff. The jihadist groups are the best funded, and they're the best organized of the rebel groups. Most of them come from outside Syria. Most of them come from Saudi Arabia. They are very well funded. They are very organized. They are not uh, nowhere near a majority. They're a minority. But that, that's the biggest fear everybody has, is that these guys might end up taking over. Uh, the Christians support Assad. 
Uh, the reason the Christians support Assad is because uh, they think that uh, what will come later will be worse for them uh, than Assad. And of course, uh, the chemical weapons are an issue. That came up today. There's a, at least a rumor that uh, one side or the other has used some chemical weapons. Uh, Military aid is a concern uh, because military aid can be misused. Uh, the Stinger missiles are a, a good example of that. And you know, the last time I've got it here is the Russians. The Russians have a very different position from the Americans on this. Uh, again, the, the foreign minister uh, from Russia was on Charlie Rose's show and uh, elaborating their position. And their position is we should try to figure out what the government is going to be at the end and then essentially oust Assad not oust Assad and then you know, try to figure out what the government's going to be. Uh, and what they propose is that all the sides put some people, uh, identify some people that can come together and, and work on um, a, a, essentially a draft constitution and have some idea of, of what's going to happen at the end and how the minorities are, minority religions are going to be protected. That was, that's, at least that, that's their argument. Okay. North Korea. Uh, this um, next one is going to be a picture of the geniuses uh, from the uh, North Korean chapter of Minsa. <laughs> so, in case. Uh, you haven't heard the, 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 the details of the first the statement that was made that really got everybody charged up. This came from a uh, deputy defense minister. Um, and you've, heard, you've heard about it, but maybe not the statement itself. Uh, our intercontinental ballistic missiles are on standby. <clears throat> if we push the button, they will blast off, and their barrage will turn Washington, the stronghold of American imperialist, and the nest of evil into a sea of fire. So that's his statement. Now, there have been some more statements that, um, about bullets raining down on South Korea. Uh, the question is, you know, what do we do about it? Um, we are, as, as you know, if you, you follow the news, we're doing a lot more uh, on <clears throat> uh, work on uh, detection of, of incoming missiles, uh, shooting down incoming missiles. Uh, I'm going to give. I'm going out kind of out on a limb and give you my opinion on this. Um, first of all, uh, China. Uh, an official of China wrote an article in the New York in the no, in the Financial Times. Financial Times is a sister publication of the Economist. It's the newspaper that's a version of the Economist. Uh, he wrote an editorial saying, suggesting that China maybe needs to think about abandoning support for. North Korea. Uh, so I, it seems to me there's an opening for two-party talks uh, between the United States and China on <coughs> North Korea. The first thing I think the Chinese need to know is that we, we have a uh, uh, contingency plan to take out the nuclear weapons. They need to know that we have it. They don't need to know what the details are, but they need to know, um, they should know that we have it. Um, the other thing I would, yeah, I might do, that's why I'm kind of, this is, I'm kind of out on a limb. I, th I think I would ask the Chinese, I tell the Chinese, we're going to put out a news release, uh, and we'd like you to put one out after we do, saying that you understand the reasoning, our reasoning for the news release. Our news release would say, you know, if there's an, if there's a, uh, an attack, uh, a nuclear attack on the United States, uh, we will retaliate, and uh, North Korea uh, will be uninhabitable for the next 100 years. Uh, that's I said, that's pretty strong. So now we're going to talk about China. Uh, and the question here is, when will the Middle Kingdom dominate the world? Well, maybe the speaker next month can answer that question better than I can. Uh, I've got a picture. This is, this is one of my favorite pictures of China. We have it hanging uh, in our entryway. Uh, that's the um, Himalaya Mountains in the background. Um, so China is about the same size geographically as, as the United States. We're both about 3.7, 3.8 million square miles. It's very much, very close in size. In population, we have 315 million. They have more than four times as many people. That's why China is such a big market. It's, it's by far the biggest market for automobiles. It's the biggest market for pizzas. It's the biggest market for uh, many, many things. You know, our market for automobiles is about 12 million a year. The China market is about 18 million a year. Uh, Volkswagen, by the way, is the 
by far the biggest player in that market. Um, okay, so when will their gross national product surpass the U.S.? Uh, Merrill Lynch Division of Bank, Bank of America says 2017. The Economist Magazine said 2019. But the Economist uh, uh, International Unit said 2021. So there's within the Economist, there's some disagreements. These are the intellectuals, uh, you know, within the Economist. Uh, the IMF said 2023. So I was just kind of curious. You know, uh, uh, they all have different assumptions. So I just took the, the GDP for 2012 for the U.S. and for China. I assumed a 2% growth rate for the U.S. and 8% growth rate for China. And I said, I want to know when these will cross. Well, it turns out about 2013 with those assumptions. 2023. Did I say 2013? 2023 is when they would cross. I, you know, I don't know how the International Monetary Fund uh, calculated it, but uh, now that's total GDP. Per capita GDP is a very, very different story. Per capita GDP in the United States is about fifty thousand dollars. Per capita GDP in China is nine thousand. Uh, so it's going to be a long, long time before China catches up with the with the U.S. Uh, in per capita GDP. Um, but by the middle of the century, you know, their aggregate GDP could be could be double uh, the U.S. India could be bigger than the U.S. At that point in time, it's uh, it's possible that you know China will be the largest, India will be second, uh, probably the European Union is third. They're already a little bit bigger than the U.S. Uh, and the U.S. may be fourth, which means that we will likely be l less influential in the uh, in foreign affairs in in the world uh, in the world ahead. That we live in ahead, uh, and I think that's important. I think it's important that we get some of the things in place that we want to see to protect our interests uh, before uh, other people have a, a, a stronger position. Okay, military spending in China. They spent 140 last year. Spent 143 billion on military. It's uh, about two percent of their GDP. Uh, we spent five times that amount, 711 billion, or which is 4.8 percent of uh, of GDP. Um, as time goes on, and as they become a uh, larger and larger economy, it will be easy, much easier for them to keep up uh, in, in military spending because it takes uh, you know a small percentage to keep up with uh, you know a smaller percentage to keep up with us. Uh, they are the second largest in the world in terms of military spending after the United States. Okay, now we're going to talk about the subject that's more. It's interesting to me. Technology and globalization. And here I'm going to talk about uh, a theory that I have that uh, I don't know that anybody else has and I don't know that anybody else supports, but uh, you're going to hear about it anyway. Uh, yeah, this, uh, and the question I'm trying to address is why do healthcare and education trail manufacturing in the application of technology? So that's a controversial question, I think, you know, right from the start. Uh, economists divide industries, one way economists divide industries is into tradable industries and non-tradable industries. Tradable industries produce products that can be sold in other areas. They can, be, they can be produced in other countries, they can produce other parts of the United States, but they can be sold and produced in one area and sold in another area. Non-tradable products and services are, have to be produced where they are consumed. Uh, so examples of non-tradable are education, healthcare, uh, and, and retail. They all have to be produced you know, locally. Uh, I want to say something about manufacturing, because that's my, been my experience. I worked with John Deere for many decades. Uh, and the, uh, the manufacturers have, have competed you know, worldwide. Uh, they have been driven to reduce costs and improve quality by the global competition. Uh, we, we, you hear a lot about jobs that have been outsourced, but there have been more jobs lost to technology than there have been uh, outsourced. Uh, you know, when I started John Deere, there were there must have been thousands of welders, and today there's hardly any welders. Uh, it's all done by robots. Uh, there were hundreds of, of spray painters. That's all done by robots. Uh, the technology the manufacturing has had to adopt technology in order to bring down prices and, and keep their quality good 
uh, or raise their quality. Uh, you know, quality's always been a huge issue at, uh, at John Deere. Okay. Uh, tradable industry, well, okay, we're going to move on to the tradable. Now, you know, retail is different from healthcare and education in this respect. In retail, customers pay for whatever it is they're buying. You go to a store, you pay the full cost of whatever it is you're getting. Uh, so there is a market in retail for a low-cost producer. Uh, healthcare is not that way, but uh, there is in retail, there is a market for a low-cost producer. So what happened, Amazon came into the market. Uh, now they're almost a, a, a tradable. They, they produce the product somewhere else and they deliver it uh, to, to your house. Uh, they are very, very, very efficient. Uh, I don't know if you know, but the, the way they produce books, they don't have these huge inventory of books uh, the way Borders and Barnes and Noble do. They have a machine. When you place an order, this machine prints the book, binds the book, puts the book in, uh, a mailing, and it, it goes off to you. They don't. They don't carry these big inventories of, uh, of books like the, uh, like the bookstores. They're ex extremely efficient. Okay. So what's happened? Of course, this is a good example of where technology has uh, come to come into play, and the inefficient producers, borders, as an example, um, have have left the uh, left the market. Okay. We're going to talk first about education. Uh, I gotta see what this. Oh, <clears throat> the cartoon. This uh, kid says uh, some hacker from an obscure university in China ate my homework. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd give him credit for a pretty creative. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be true. <laughs> Okay, well, first I want to talk a little bit about education. Education is, is, is not a free market by any means. Uh, the, the Golden High School and the Evergreen High School don't compete for, for students. Uh, the primary education is paid for, not paid for by the people who are consuming it. It's paid for by our taxes. So it's a very, very different from you know, retail. Uh, there isn't the same degree of competition. Consequently, I'm going to argue is there isn't the same drive to reduce costs and improve quality using technology that there has been in manufacturing. That's, that's, that's my fundamental argument. And I'm going to make the same fundamental argument about uh, education, too. Uh, no Health care, I'm sorry. I'm on education. OK, so uh, <laughs> i got to remember where I am. Uh, country rankings. This is the uh, OECD, the uh, organization for the Economic Developed Country, OECD, yeah, the countries. It's not all countries. But uh, Finland is consistently ranked number one. South Korea is almost always ranked number two in the tests. Uh, Hong Kong's three. Japan's four. Singapore, five. The United States is um, 17th. Uh, and you've, you've seen this in the, in the news. Um, this, is, this is nothing new to you. Uh, and I'm sure you've also seen in the news that uh, the Shanghai, the city, of Sh Sh Shanghai, Shanghai public school system, uh, blew away everybody. And it's just a city, but they scored incredibly high on, on their tests. So um, I, again, I'm going to argue that technology has not uh, made its way into education in the same way it has in, in manufacturing. It's emerging, though. And the Khan Academy is a good example of this. And, uh, most of you, I would assume, have heard about the Khan Academy. Maybe I see hands. How many have heard about Salman Khan's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, what these are are free uh, YouTube courses. Um, uh, and what they do is they provide individual instructions. So a student can move as fast as the student uh, needs to move in order to learn whatever the subject is. Um, they have 6 million students. They have 40 employees. Uh, Bill Gates is a, is a big supporter. I've, I've looked at some of the classes. You know, they're all right. There's a, certainly <laughs> room for some improvement. Uh, and I'm going to talk about you know, some of that in a minute. But, uh, but this is the application of technology uh, for teaching students on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, and it, it's uh, the application of the technology could improve, eventually improve our, uh, our education system. Now I want to talk about MOOCs. Uh, MOOCs. Yeah, have you all heard about MOOCs? Yes? No? Okay, everybody's heard about MOOCs. No, no. Oh, MOOCs are massive online, open online courses. Uh, these are, these, the ones I'm going to talk about are relatively new. 
Uh, you know, a lot of colleges had online courses before. You know, uh, DeVry did, and most of the Phoenix did. Uh, these are uh, these are uh, much much better courses. Uh, the three major players. Well, there's one major player. Coursera is the major player there. I think they've got 75% of the of this market. Uh, edX is uh, probably the second largest, and Udacity is the third. Uh, we're going to look at Coursera. Coursera was the uh, concept of a of Stanford professor. He got four universities to come in uh, and work with him in the beginning to develop the courses. They are Stanford, Michigan, Penn, and Princeton. Now, the important thing I think about this is these are credible universities. These are academic institutions that are well regarded for their for their academics. They have uh, 29 uh, universities that have joined them. Uh, in 2012, they had 300,000 students taking 38 courses, all for no credit. Uh, and, and this year, they have 2.4 million students. You can see what growth at eight times the growth in one year. They're taking uh, 214 courses. Uh, worldwide, not just in the United States, but people can take them worldwide. And by 2018, uh, they expect to have 5,000 um, courses. Now, they are just starting their uh, uh, accredited courses. And I'm a little more, for obvious reasons, a little more familiar with Penn. Uh, Penn has done some calculus courses through Coursera. Uh, you can take uh, calculus courses, and the cost of a calculus course for credit is $178. No, for credit, for credit. No credits are free. They're free for no credit. But if you want to take a course and get credit, $178. This is a remarkable price for uh, uh, a course uh, from an Ivy League school. You know, Penn and Princeton are both uh, two of the eight Ivy League schools. So it's, uh, uh, it, it's a remarkable price for a, a credit course. Uh, this kind of teaching, I think, is going to dramatically impact the whole world of education. Now, I want to talk about an example uh, of this. One of the universities uh, developed, uh, by the way, uh, Penn says it, talks, it costs about $50,000 to create one of these courses. And of course, you can calculus doesn't change from year to year. You know, you can use it worldwide over and over and over. Uh, one of the universities developed a um, physics 101 course. And before they developed it, they studied the way people learn. And when they developed the online course, what they did was, in the online course, there's an instructor who's teaching physics. And he teaches for 10 to 12 minutes. And then there's questions that the student has to answer. If the questions, if the student doesn't get the answers right, then they get more lesson about the subject. If they do get it right, they move on to a new subject. So the university took half of their students in Physics 101 and put them in the regular classroom with a full professor. The other half took the uh, online course, and they were randomly selected, the online course um, <clears throat> with an instructor doing, doing the teaching. And they, then, they, of course, they checked at the end of the year to see how well they, or at the end of the uh, semester, how well they did in the finals. Those students with the online course did better on the finals than the students that were in the, uh, the, the regular uh, classroom. Uh, the very bright students are going to do well regardless of which, which way. But the ones that are in the low end of the curve did far better uh, with the uh, online courses than, uh, than they did in the classroom. So I think it's interesting. I, this, is, this is a technology that seems to me is uh, coming. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have a big impact on the cost of education. It's going to have a huge impact on the way we teach people. Uh, it's, it seems to me reasonable that a lot of the community colleges could pick these courses up and, and use them to teach, uh, teach their students uh, fairly, uh, fairly inexpensively. Now that's, a, again, I'm an opinion now. But So OK, I, I should have said uh, the other two <coughs> that I mentioned were edX. edX is uh, um, Harvard, MIT. Uh, and they've picked up a few additional uh, universities. Audacity is independent. Uh, they are get, they got, I think they got their original funding from Google, but they have some venture capital behind them. OK, so here are, I'm going to talk about the issues and the barriers just briefly. Um, 
the issues with the online courses historically has been the quality of quality of education in the online courses. Uh, they just they just haven't been as good as um, the uh, in classroom courses. The quality is picking up. The example, of course, I gave was the physics class, where the quality probably is better than the classroom. Um, uh, and, and I think the quality is just going to continue to get better as people learn more and more about you know, how people learn and apply the way they learn to the online courses. Uh, there is resistance by educators, and of course there's resistance by, uh, particularly in the uh, primary and secondary, the, the teachers unions, uh, because they can see what's coming is uh, a, a much more efficient education system requiring less teachers. Uh, and I think that's a reasonable uh, a conclusion on their part. Okay, health car, have I got time for a story? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I heard this from a, po a famous politician. I can't, I can't think of his name. Anyway, he said he was talking about a local uh, doctor who uh, was asked to give a talk at the uh, downtown ladies club. And he agreed, and they said, well, now we want you to talk on <clears throat> sex. And he said, all right. Uh, he agreed to do it. Uh, he told his wife that evening that uh, he had been asked to be the luncheon speaker at the downtown ladies club. And she said, well, what's the subject? And he started to say sex. But he knew she was an attorney. He knew he would, she didn't want to edit every single word that he said. So he said, sailing. And she said, well, that's interesting. Anyway, she ran into one of her friends a couple weeks later after the talk, and her friend said, you're, you know, your husband was the luncheon speaker at our last, uh, our last uh, meeting. And um, she, the wife said, well, how did he do? She said, he really did a great job. And the wife said, you know, that's pretty remarkable, since he's only done it twice, and the first time he threw up, and the second time he lost his hat. <laughs> Okay, here's, here's the cartoon for healthcare. Uh, the doctor says, uh oh, your coverage doesn't seem to include illness. <laughs> <laughs> so, here are the World Healthcare uh, Organization rankings. Um, I spent a little bit of time on this chart. Uh, France uh, is ranked number one. France has a per capita cost for health care of $3,000, a life expectancy of 81 percent, uh, 81 years, 81 years. Uh, the French were, at, in a poll, uh, there's different questions in these polls, but in a poll, uh, the French were asked, uh, do you think France has the best health care system in the world? 70 percent of the French said yes. Uh, the World Health Corps Organization has confirmed this. Uh, Italy is a little lower in cost and a little higher in uh, life expectancy. Uh, Japan, uh, about 2,300 per capita, 80, almost 84 years in life expectancy. <coughs> the UK is 2,500 and uh, almost 26 in, uh, per, in cost. Uh, 80 years for life expectancy. They were asked the same question, same poll. They were asked the same question as the uh, as the French. Uh, do you think your health care system is the best system in the world? 59% uh, of them responded yes. Uh, Canada uh, spends uh, you know, almost 3,200 per capita. They have a fairly good life expectancy, 81.5 years. Their question was, do you think your health care system is better than the health care system in the U.S. 91% said they thought their health care system was better. Uh, this is uh, probably a little different than what you hear about people that uh, have little stories about Canadians that can't get, uh, can't get health care. Uh, the U.S. ranks 38th. Uh, we spend twice as much uh, per capita as uh, any of the uh, uh, OECD countries. Uh, we have a, a shorter lifespan. Uh, the Americans were asked uh, if they think their health care system is the best in the world, and 45% uh, said they did. They thought it was. I, I want to go into just uh, you know, one slide on France. France has a much, uh, just as an, to illustrate uh, this, France has a much higher rate of lung disease than, uh, than the United States. And the reason they do is because they have a lot more smokers in France than they do. Yet, France spends one-eighth the cost to treat lung disease that the United States spends. One-eighth the cost that we, we spend. They have one-third the fatality rate. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And, and the, the, the way they do it is with early detection. So uh, they are do, doing something very well in, um, in, in healthcare. Uh, there are good examples of healthcare institutions in the United States. The Mayo Clinic is certainly one of them. They have very high quality uh, healthcare. And uh, they have, and they have low cost. They say that they do it with two two things: uh, demanding application of best practices and extensive use of technology. They say those are the two things that help them uh, drive down their healthcare costs. Yeah, they've had computerized patient records for more than 25 years. Uh, we're just kind of getting around to it, uh, at least at our doctor's office and uh, probably a, a lot of other doctor's offices. Uh, I, I was in one, of the, one, one doctor's office and I was talking about this and they said, well, what is a best practice? So my guess is they were involved in, <laughs> uh, they were engaged in best practice. Uh, okay, those are the two things they say. I think salary doctors, uh, in the case of a Mayo Clinic, may also have a, an impact on their low cost because Mayo Clinic also has less tests per patient than, uh, than other health care, they have far less tests. So the doctors uh, don't have to run tests in order to get paid more. Uh, they tend to run the tests that they think the patient needs. But uh, so there are, good, there are some examples of uh, low cost health providers in, in the US. Uh, one of our problems, at least in my mind, is the health care lobby. In 2012, uh, the, the healthcare industry spent $3.3 billion on lobbying. This is four times as much as the defense industry spends on lobbying per year. There, are two, there were, at the end of the year, 2,374 lobbyists in the healthcare industry. That's 23 lobbyists for every member of Congress. 23 healthcare lobbyists for every member of Congress. Well, you know, what are these people able to get done? Well, a good example is the uh, Medicare uh, Prescription Drug Act that was passed in, I don't know, 03, somewhere around there. Uh, Medicare has to pay full retail price for drugs under that act. Uh, the Veterans Administration gets a 40% discount. Uh, Medic Medicaid gets a discount. Uh, Canada, France, Germany, Spain, the UK, all get discounts. The biggest buyer of prescription drugs is Medicare, and they do not get a discount. And the reason they don't is because the lobbyists were able to get a provision in uh, that act that uh, required Medicare uh, to pay full retail price. You know, despite that, if you read the Time article on, on medicine, Medicare is, is an extremely efficient uh, operation. Um, Okay, so here are the issues, what I think are the issues and the barriers in, uh, in health care, uh, lobbying and election funding. You know, on, on the Medicare uh, issue, there was one person in Congress that raised this, uh, this is maybe a year ago, they ought to do something about uh, Medicare having to pay full retail price, he won out of... Uh, 535, 435 in the House and 100 in the Senate. One that raised the issue, and and it, of course went away right away. I mean, this is an obvious way we can cut our deficit, is is by just giving Medicare the right to negotiate on drug prices. Uh, it, it's a very obvious way, but nobody's talking about it. And even this guy didn't. And I think probably, pro I'm guessing, probably what happened is somebody on his staff said, "Look, you're getting some funding, uh, you know, for your election uh, from the pharmaceutical industry." And if you keep this up, they're going to give their money to uh, your opponent in the next election. Anyway, he went silent. Nobody's talking about it. So uh, I think one of the issues is uh, lobbying and, and election funding. Uh, we haven't talked much about regulations, but there's uh, that we're overregulated. Uh, legal costs, you know, there's frivolous lawsuits. That's that it helps. That that raises our costs. Uh, just a word on regulation. Uh, we have a list now. The government publishes a list of uh, uh, oh, I can't think of the term. It, it's uh, I, I, I'm losing it. Uh, uh, different different kinds of diseases and uh, different kinds of injuries. I can't think of the term for it. But at any rate, there are uh, six different codes for. Burns resulting from water skiing. Now that just gives you an idea how much uh, you know regulation you have. There also, of course, is you know there's resistance to change. Somebody years ago asked Albert Einstein, "What is the most powerful force in the universe?" 
Einstein said, compound interest. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's a status quo. <laughs> um, and the status quo is just really hard to move. And the, uh, the, these are electronic uh, uh, medical records or you know, uh, <clears throat> computerized patient information. Uh, there's been a lot of resistance that's coming. Computerized diagno diagnostics are available. Not very many people are using them. Best practices uh, are, you know, have, have helped drive down in some areas, but again, they're not widely used. Uh, solutions that other countries have. I put French solutions you know, here because uh, people are more resistant to the French uh, solutions than they are to German solutions, I think. But uh, there may be German, Japanese solutions. There may be a lot of solutions around. Uh, and, and the French, just as an example, you know what happened in, in Iraq? The French didn't join us in Iraq, so we, just, we, we took the serious step of uh, uh, banning the, the term French fries and changed them to something else. Uh, freedom fries, yeah, freedom fries. They're no longer French fries, they're freedom fries. Well, Canada and Mexico didn't join us in the war in Iraq either for the same reasons the French didn't. We didn't drink, quit drinking Canadian club. We didn't quit going to Mexican restaurants. It's uh, for some reason the French uh, take the brunt of uh, uh, that's. I got off. I got off the track here. <laughs> I, I you can easily get off track. So my conclusion here is that technology will event, will eventually drive down costs in both education uh, and healthcare, uh, but it will be very slow to um, implement. I'm much more uh, optimistic about education. Uh, than I am healthcare. Government's less involved in education. They're much more involved in healthcare uh, and you know, get involved with the lobbies and you know all the money that's sloshing around in the in the healthcare industry. But I think technology is going to I, these these forecasts that people say. You know, if you go out to 2050, our medical costs are just going to be astronomical. Yeah, I kind of doubt that because the the assumption they're making is there are no technological improvements. You know, in the next you know 40 years, it's the same mistake that Malthus made when he said we were going to run out of food. He just ignored technology, and technology solved the problem. Technology is going to solve a lot of the problems, I think, and uh, if, if we can get it implemented. So, I guess, hey, uh, that's the ad for my uh, blog, and some of the stuff you just heard is going to be on the blog whenever I get time to do it. <laughs>
that we know is right for them. Well, not only is that pretty arrogant, it's actually racist. Uh, I, I think there are many cases where we could let these people solve some of their own problems. I, that's, and, and if we do that more, we don't need the, uh, we, we could do it with less military. I'm not sure why we still need big military forces in Germany, uh, in, in Japan, uh, in 80 countries around the world. I think we could bring some of them home. And that money all goes outside the country. That doesn't help our economy at all. I'm sorry. Uh, with all this lobbying and this crony capitalism in the healthcare field, and by losing our one guy who stood up, <laughs> one person stood up, given that the elections cost so many billions of dollars, the way we run election campaigns, what, in, what possibly could be the answer? Uh, I think we ought to look at, I guess I think we ought to look at other countries. Uh, the Europeans do it for a lot less money. The things that we do, the, 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 uh, you know, almost to the point of buying you know, uh, representatives, buy contributions to their campaigns, uh, those things are illegal in most democracies. They, they're, they're, they're considered uh, uh, corruption. What we've done is we've legalized the corruption here. Uh, I, you know, I think if, if, we, if, if you couldn't buy, if you couldn't buy, if special interests could not buy elected representatives, the elected representatives would be more working more for the, um, for the people. Yeah, I, th I guess I think it's a pretty big, it's a big problem now. Yeah, what do we do about it? I don't know. Clean slate now. Clean slate now. I just dot org. Dot org. There's the answer. Clean slate now. Dot org. So I've got some people that uh, uh, agree with that that opinion. Hey, Dave. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you got to have at least one question from your neighbors. Um, <laughs> my wife and I are immigrants. I, so I want to get back to the language issue. Uh, there used to be a time when to live in this country, you had to speak English. A lot of Swedes came over in the mid-1800s, and they didn't speak much English. But they very quickly had to learn, because that was the only way to get by. So quite frankly, I don't give a hoot about this 120 languages in New York or 80 languages in the uh, Los Angeles school districts, there's a very simple solution. English is the main language in the United States and should always be so. What do you think of that? <laughs> yeah. uh, first of all, I, I agree with you. Secondly, I don't think it's worth a constitutional amendment at all. Uh, but, I, but I do agree. And you know, one of my interesting observations that's interesting to me, a lot of things are interesting to me that aren't interesting to anybody else, but the Asians that come to this country speak much more difficult languages than the, the uh, Latinos, as an example, and they learn English, and they end up excelling. Uh, the, they, they make up something like 20%, they make up 3% of the population, but 20% of the people that are in PhD programs in, in science and technology, uh, they, they learn the language and, uh, and, and they seem to excel uh, pretty well. Uh, that brings up another subject that's of, of, of interest to me, but we didn't talk about. And that, that is, uh, it's on the immigration. You know, when, uh, when somebody gets a degree in, uh, a foreigner gets a degree in science, technology, anything else, they have to go back to their own country. This is absolutely stupid. We ought to keep them here. Uh, a lot of them want to stay here, but we're required to send them back because of our laws. Uh, we ought to be keeping those people here. They go back. They start companies over there. They compete with us. Uh, they could be doing a lot. Microsoft couldn't find enough good technical people in the United States, and they opened up a research facility in Vancouver, British Columbia. Yep. We could have all the revenue from, uh, from the taxes paid by those people uh, in, in the United States if we had a, a sensible uh, immigration uh, rule. I didn't answer that completely, but uh, I, got, well, I, I danced around it. I'd just it. like to add that a lot of the immigrants that came over uh, in the early days of immigration to the U.S. were poor and uneducated. They were Italians. They were 
uh, Slavic people, they were Scandinavians, and they still had to learn English because it was the way to survive. You had to. So I don't buy this argument that the Latinos are at a disadvantage because they got a uh, they're they're coming in as low educated people and they got a tough language. Baloney. English is a Latin language. Okay. Well, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Dave, uh, back uh, going back to Iraq. Uh, do you have a feel for uh, how many years it might take uh, for that country to stabilize, and whether it will more likely st uh, uh, get another dictator like S Hussein, or whether it might become reasonably democratic and, and uh, free for the y year, years ago? Somebody explained to me the difference between a specialist and a, and a generalist. A specialist is a person who knows more and more about less and less, and pretty soon they know everything about nothing. A generalist is a person who knows less and less about more and more, and pretty soon they know nothing, nothing about everything. I'm a generalist. <laughs> Uh, well, and, and yeah, it's, I think it's really hard to predict uh, what's going to happen. Uh, uh, actually, Yogi Berra had a good line on that. He said, forecasting is relatively easy except for the part that deals with the future. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I, as long as you brought that up, one, I was going to make another comment on Iraq, uh, and Iran, and, and North Korea. Uh, I think it's kind of hard for them to predict what we're going to do. And the reason I do is because in North Korea, uh, our President Bush at that time said over and over, we will not allow the North Koreans to have nuclear weapons. Well, of course, we did. Uh, now, today we're probably maybe, maybe sorry that we did. But we, in fact, did. So there, there's a precedent out there uh, that the uh, Iranians certainly know about. Uh, and is that going to affect their thinking and what they're doing? And I wouldn't even hazard a guess at how Iranians think. But uh, I just raise, raise that question. Uh, hello, Dave. Um, I'm a retired uh, surgeon, and I have some experience of both Canada and the US. Uh, um, and the Canadian system does work. Um, it, it works remarkably well. Um, I, the only thing I would add to that is to add a two-tier system. In other words, provide care for everybody. But if you want plastic surgery or, or some fancy uh, cardiac procedures, you have to have you have to pay for it pay or for have it. insurance. And I think that would work very well. A, th a third comment is, the, is when Ronald Reagan wanted to suggest catastrophic insurance. And there, I believe there's a place for preventing people from going bankrupt because of catastrophic medical expenses. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. I've yeah, enjoyed I think your I, talk. I would agree with you on both. There are there are uh, almost no bankruptcies in Europe because of medical costs, and there are something like eight hundred thousand a year in the United States. Oh. Okay, Dave's told me we have time for about sixteen more questions, <laughs> so we're going to start right here. We'll do uh, four more, I think, and then uh, we'll, we'll let you off. My question is actually very quick. Who was that congressman? <laughs> uh, I uh, unfortunately I don't remember. He was on I, he was on CNN, but uh, uh, that's well I can't yeah don't know don't know. I, it was not one of ours. You can write to ours and see if you get anywhere. Probably not. Dave, thanks very much. You're very entertaining, and informative. Any one of those subjects we could have spent hours on. Yes. And uh, I guess there's there's some things I think about is in the United States from a healthcare standpoint, I've been part of what are essentially the four systems of healthcare throughout the world. And just because of being in the military, being on Medi Medicare now and being employed and paying my own. I mean, in the United States, we have all four systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, so somebody says France, somebody says, I mean, I don't know why we can't learn from our own stuff. And the only other thing, as far as that life thing is, is a doctor once said, birth is a death sentence. <laughs> I think we have just two more, then we have uh, a couple of important announcements at the end. Okay. Uh, hi, Dave. Uh, I'm a teacher, and um, I saw what you... Um, 
Okay. <laughs> I'm very excited back here. Um, you put the, the rankings, and we see Finland and South Korea, and then you talk about best practices, and you talk about these wonderful online classes. My question is, do Finland and South Korea use online classes? What are they doing that makes them number one, and why don't we want to be like that? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, South Korea... The school year is far longer, and the school days are far longer than they are in the United States. Both those countries have two different approaches to doing this. Uh, theirs is, you know, many more hours in class. No, they're not using, uh, to, to, to the best of my knowledge, online education. Finland has an entirely different approach. They don't spend, I don't think they spend any more hours in class than we do. They have very high-paid teachers. Uh, you have to have at least a master's degree to teach in the Finland schools. Uh, their teachers earn salaries comparable to doctors and lawyers. They are very well-paid teachers. So they have, uh, they, they've set up uh, uh, just a really high quality uh, uh, teaching staff. So, so, the two, so, so there are different approaches to teaching that can produce, both produce good results. So I'm also a teacher um, for Denver Public Schools, and I would just challenge the idea that we don't compete with each other for students um, because the law in Colorado is about choice. We are actually competing with each other for students constantly, and now with the... Um, with the addition of charter schools, the competition has gotten really, really intense. And so um, I would also suggest the idea that there's also a certain amount of marketing that happens at each school. And, um, you know, as teachers, we're responsible for that as well. And so um, your original idea regarding that we are not in competition with each other, I think that I would suggest otherwise. Okay, I'm going to, yeah, there's two parts to that. One is there, there's really no free market in, in education or in healthcare, in my opinion, because the people who are buying the services aren't paying for them. Uh, and now I, I understand that with uh, uh, there, there is some, some competition going on. But the schools here are not competing with the schools in Shanghai. They're not competing with the schools in Korea. They're not competing with the schools in Japan. In the manufacturing industry, at you know, John Deere, we were competing with Japanese. We were competing with Europeans. Uh, we were competing with big countries around the world, all of whom were trying to drive down their costs and improve their quality in, in order to compete more effectively. Uh, so you're competing you know, locally with you know, some of the same schools. I, I understand that. There is, is some competition. Uh, I, I would argue that it's a completely different situation. Okay. Oh. Uh, do you want to have uh, one last question? We have... Uh, 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 we'll do one last question right here. Now, I would suggest that actually there is competition because, in fact, all of us are going to be dependent upon the quality of the kids who are educated in our public schools because they're the ones who are going to become our police officers, our firemen, our doctors, our dentists, our lawyers. So we better be, you know, we, we are paying for that. We are buying, you know, we are paying for the public schools and we are, you know, we have a very strong interest in that education system. Yeah, my argument, and, and by the way, you know a lot more about education than I do. I, I, I will hand that to you, absolutely. My argument really has been we need to make better use of technology. That's sort of the fundamental argument that I'm trying to make, that we need to make better use of technology in teaching our students. We can use it to teach students on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, it's like having a private tutor. We can just we can utilize technology. I think we can do a lot better job. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I, you know I'm a I'm a finance guy from a manufacturing company. I'm not gonna try to tell you that I know uh, uh, much at all about education. Despite that, Dave, we still like you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>